um, and that you know he wasn't able to do it. Obviously, just because he wanted to doesn't mean that it would have happened. It's a whole bunch of political processes. Lenin's wife actually said that if he was alive, I think in 1929, he, Lenin would be in prison. Um, but the uh, so yeah, I don't I don't think there's a specific moment when it happened. We feel that at least by 1920 or 1932, with, when Hitler came to power, there is a real qualitative change that had happened at some point. Okay. Then this is a follow-up. So you mentioned this notion of proletarian bonapartism. Um, do you see Trotsky's writing, right, the former generals, um, right, because you have the purges of the generals, mm -hmm. and this is mostly in response to Trotsky writing uh, from exile to overthrow Stalin and then take control of the Soviet Union. Um, do you view that as a positive thing or a negative thing? Yeah, I, oh, I forgot to address the purges. Um, I think some Trotskyists tend to view this as a purely democratic thing. Like, oh, we want democracy too, you know. Uh, in my opinion, genuine Trotskyists don't spend eight billion years, we don't want the fourth degree of democracy. It's not about, oh, well, there wasn't enough democracy, so, you know, burn them, you know. Uh, it wasn't like that at all. In, in our opinion, the Actually, what Trotsky says, if you, if you read The Revolution of Betrayed, he says specifically, if the bureaucracy could lead to socialism, we would critically support it, regardless of how many people they execute. That's what he says. And I think that that's a very dialectical way of looking at it. It might seem kind of cold-blooded. But the whole point that he's trying to make is not that he likes executing people. The point he's trying to make is, the question is not about, well, how much democracy is there? How many people are being killed? How many, you know, abstract human ideas, human rights, or something like that. The question is, what will lead to socialism? And in Trotsky's view, and in my view, the bureaucracy, and I think we've seen in history, it show itself, that Stalinism doesn't lead to socialism. It leads to its opposite. Um, it leads to capitalist restoration at a certain point. Um, so that's, that's precisely what he was saying as far as, uh, in, in our view, what we are for is not just, you know, complaining about every little movement because they're not perfect, but about what policies are actually going to lead to socialism. I'll take it from anybody. I don't care if it's, you know, Ho Chi Minh or whatever. If it actually leads to socialism, but can it? You know, will it? And I would say, I would venture to say in this, in today's world, uh, where there is no Soviet Union for, you know, governments to balance on, or for some middle class movement to take over the, the, the workers' movement, I would say it's impossible without a revolutionary socialist party. Um, two questions, or I, I guess one qualification. Um, you mentioned that Lenin was possibly looking to remove Stalin, but also wasn't Lenin extraordinarily critical of not just Stalin, but also uh, Kamabev, also Zinovev, and also Trotsky. Um, and I mean, isn't it, isn't it the case, even in, in your view, that Lenin was historically very distrustful of Trotsky, especially because Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks extraordinarily late in the revolutionary game, as it were. Um, so one is, isn't it essentially the case that Stalin wanted to n not throw out, but remove the power from most of the, the inner herd, the so-called old Bolsheviks, especially with Lenin's testament, which called for the expansion of the Central Committee. And so you would agree with that? Um, or do you think that's a distortion? Um, well, no, I do think that he was incredibly cri uh, critical uh, of uh, various factions. Throughout the whole history of, you know, before the revolution, during the Soviet government, uh, and toward the end of his life, there was a lot of um, alliances made, changes in positions. I think that initially Leon Trotsky um, was, there's a, there a rift between Lenin and Trotsky because of the, I don't know, I don't know if this is, it seems like this is a pretty educated crowd. <laughs> I don't know if it's too esoteric, uh, but like the old, you know, 19, what was it, 1902 Congress where there's a split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, Leon Trotsky kind of had a vacillating position between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. He wanted them to unite, um, and uh, there was more. More that actually did begin to happen in 1905, uh, after the 1905 revolution. But then, you know, went complete opposite after that, um, with the with the ebb of the revolutionary movement in 1906. Um, and then he came back uh, in 1917 uh, with his own group, and eventually they ended up fusing. 
Um, I mean, these are all kind of his... I think it's important to bring it up because of how it relates to today. So I don't want people to think this is just some kind of like, a, a, you know, well, okay. Oh, that's a really interesting history lesson, but what are we doing now? Um, but I think it really reflects the differences in, you know, what the different factions represented. I, I believe that each faction within the government represented a certain moment. Uh, to some degree, you know, the working class or sections of the middle class, uh, or a section, or other groups, that in, in, I believe that Stalin, for example, represented, uh, like I said, something that tried to balance between all of them, but ultimately represented the ruling group. Um, I feel like there was a period where Lenin uh, and Trotsky were kind of disagreeing, and uh, while during this, not just, like, during the revolution, I believe Lenin and Trotsky really uh, came together. Uh, there, that was the moment where they agreed, you know, um, and, uh, you know, Lenin said there was no better Bolshevik than Leon Trotsky, you know, when he came back. Um, and, uh, you know, the, during that whole period, I, when the April thesis happened, when they were talking about reorienting the party toward actually taking power instead of just making deals with, you know, Mensheviks, uh, even letting them into their, like, party congresses and stuff, when they're running this capitalist government, um, that at the time, um, you know, there, there was a very close unity between them. There was a period, I think, in 1920, when there was a, a bit of a rupture and different factions, uh, you know, didn't know what to do with the the situation in Russia. They were, essentially they were isolated, you know, a lot like Cuba is today. Uh, the, the revolutions in Eastern Europe or in Western Europe didn't happen, or they did happen and they went down to failure. Um, and uh, there was different factions that were saying, well, we need to go to war, you know, revolutionary war now. There were sections that saying that were saying we need to, you know, wait and see what happens. There were ones that saying we need to do a, a treaty, you know. Um, the treaty one eventually won out because the Germans were actually about to take over, you know, the whole whole swath of Russia anyway. Um, but I do believe that ultimately that the same political, while he did have some criticism of Le, criticisms of Leon Trotsky, in general, uh, they were pretty much in sync. That their political views were uh, very much in line, and that actually Stalin was kind of a secondary figure. Um, up until, uh, you know, later on when, in my opinion, in our opinion, uh, the, the bureaucracy that was taking power felt he was a playing tool for them. Um, May I follow up and, and qualify on that? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so perhaps I should, I should lay, lay down what's at stake for me in this discussion, which is often uh, Stalin is characterized as this leader, I mean, this even proletarian form of partisan. But I think what's important to know is that for any society, um, that, that the leader is obviously important, right? Stalin made decisions, um, Mao made decisions, Chavez makes decisions, Barack Obama makes decisions, but they do so within an entire collective. Um, and so, right, what I would say is Stalin was not in sync with Lenin to the exact same, or pretty close to the same extent, that Trotsky was not in sync with Lenin. Um, and the way in which I would characterize this would be, for example, the huge split over the NEP, the fact that Lenin condemned both Trotsky and Stalin. But in addition, right, I mean, these are lesser known figures because uh, no, one, no one that I know, at least today, is a xeno um, But, uh, but the, 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 that is a matter of fact, it, there was, the, both for Trotsky, right, it, it's important that it's not just the Trotsky wing, and the Stalin wing, right? It's the left opposition, which includes a whole host of other figures which don't agree. But also, um, it, it's, I, I, I completely disagree with the narrative of, you know, it, had Lenin survived, he would have passed it on to Trotsky. Or, I, I think this is also false, that had he survived, he would have passed it on to Stalin. I don't think he would have passed it on to either of them. And I think this is also immense, or the, the Trotsky story, is further undercut by, for example, Lenin's wife's reaction to Trotsky's The Lessons of October. Yes, she was more sympathetic to Stalin, or uh, I'm sorry, Freudian slip. She was more sympathetic to Trotsky, you know, after the death of Lenin. Mm -hmm. But in the 30s, right, she was, she ultimately sided with Stalin against Trotsky, specifically because of The Lessons of October. Um, I mean, wh what would you speak to that? Do you think that that is a fair characterization? Is that in contradistinction to what you view yourself as saying? Um, well, see, I actually think that during that period, well, there's, like I said, there's a lot of different periods in the, in the Russian Revolution 
But during the period before, when Lenin, before Lenin came back, now, you know, let me, let me qualify this before I say anything else. Uh, as far as personalities, obviously personalities always end up, made, no matter what, whether you want them to or not, end up playing a role in revolution. Uh, it's just a fact. It always has been. It's not necessarily a good thing, uh, but it's always going to be there. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, the mass people end up taking a personality and saying, this is, you know, represents me. You know, this is who, this is who I'm for. You know, I'm Trotskyist. I'm Stalinist, you know. But I wanted to make a point that while that's true, the, the real question isn't about, well, does Trotsky and Stalin fighting or whatever, but the question is, what do they actually represent? And, and in my view, these different personalities that end up looking like personalities uh, actually represent specific classes.